Hey there, Nick to the Hackers here. In this talk, we're going to go over all sorts of different tips and best practices around Dockerizing a web application and using Docker Compose. These are all tips and patterns that I've picked up over the years while working with Docker as a freelance developer. Just a heads up, by the way, this whole entire talk is going to be a live demo, not a single slide in sight. But before we get into that, let me just very quickly introduce myself. So my name is Nick Genetakis, and I've been a Docker captain since 2016. I've been working with Docker since 2014. I have a blog here with a couple hundred blog posts and videos about Docker and other web development topics. I also have a course called Dive Into Docker. So if you're brand new to Docker and you're coming at this from ground zero, you may want to check that out. Lastly, I have a podcast called Running in production where I talk to different folks about how they build and deploy their web applications. I wanted to quickly bring this one up here because if you sort this by Docker, you can see all sorts of different uh, examples of people using Docker out in the wild, either though this could be deploying to a single server using Docker Compose or a couple hundred nodes on a Kubernetes cluster. So now let's get to the good stuff and go over the example Flask application. And by the way, if you're not a Flask developer, then don't feel like you need to bail out now because everything we're about to go over will apply to any other web framework and we're not really going to go over any Flask specific code. I also do, uh, do have other example applications that are ready to go for Django, Rails, Node, Phoenix, and Play. And when it comes to Play, I just want to give a huge shout out to my friend Lexi here, who put in a lot of effort and brought her JVM and Scala and Play experience to the table. So thanks to her, we have the example Play app. Also, just a heads up, you don't need to pause a video or stream or wherever you're watching this to get any links mentioned in this talk. This one tooltip I put up right now has links to everything for all the references there. So feel free to check that out whenever you want, perhaps after the talk. Now, let's go over the tech stack before we jump into the code base, because I feel like this tech stack is pretty similar for a lot of different web applications written in a lot of different web frameworks. But, you know, the TLDR high-level overview is, you know, we have the web server itself, we have a background worker, a database cache, as well as Webpack. You know, that's what all these technologies here are. You know, I didn't list the web server here because, you know, we're dealing with web applications, so it's kind of implied. But, you know, the takeaway here is, like, if you wanted to swap out Postgres for MySQL or something else, that's really not a big deal at all. Celery, in this case, is the background worker. If you're more familiar with Rails, you might have heard of Sidekick. You know, that's a similar tool. And, you know, Redis is Redis, and we have Webpack and Tailwind. If you want to use Bootstrap instead, that's an application level change, not a big deal. But you know, the basic idea about this project is, you know, it's MIT licensed, you're meant to clone it down, you can build your application upon this, it's basically like a starter project for all those different web frameworks I mentioned as well. So that's basically what we're working at here. So I'm going to pop open a second terminal window here, just so we can take a look at the project in a browser before we take a look at the code base. And by the way, all the installation instructions are here in the readme file, so you can check them out when you'd like. And I'm going to head over to localhost 48000, and this is the application. So there's a couple of versions as well as the environment. These are all being pulled in at runtime time through environment variables. And the other example applications for like Rails, Django, etc. they all look similar to this, but have different logos and slightly different data here when it comes to things like the Flask EMV. But this is the application that we're working with, all, you know, styled up using Tailwind. So now let me jump over to a code editor here, and we'll begin by taking a look at the Docker Compose YAML file. So right away at the very top of the file, notice that there is no version 2 or version 3 defined. That's because this file is using the new Compose spec, which is available with Docker Compose 1.27. I believe that was released sometime in September in 2020, so it's been around for a while now. But uh, also, by the way, for the sake of time, can't really go into like Docker 101 stuff, like what is a volume, what is an env file. But uh, we are going to go over some uh, very basics here when it comes to the services because it's going to lead into the first pattern. So take a look here, right? We have the Postgres service, we have Redis, we have Web, and we have Worker. You know that's part of the tech stack that we went over before in the README file. And if I jump over to the other terminal here, notice when I ran the Docker Compose up that you know Postgres, Redis. Uh, web and worker are there, but there's also Webpack in the middle here. And if I scroll down to the bottom, notice, you know, Webpack clearly is running. You know, if I go to the browser, you know, it's serving all of the CSS that we see here. But, you know, going back to this compose file, you know, there's the worker, there's Web, there's Redis, and there's Postgres, but where is Webpack? You know, it's not hiding at the bottom of the file. Uh, it is nowhere to be found, at least not in this file. And that leads us to our first pattern, which is the Docker Compose override pattern, where this one is awesome because if you run a Docker Compose up like this with no arguments, then, you know, this is stuff that you probably know, right? It's Docker Compose is going to look specifically for a docker compose.yaml file, but it's also going to look for a Docker Compose override file that needs to be named exactly like this with the dots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if this file happens to exist, then Docker Compose is going to combine both this Docker Compose YAML file as well as this override file into one file. And then it's going to run that as basically one unit. So that's what we see here. We do a compose up and there's all the containers. So now let's go over this override file here. And it looks very, very similar to a standard Docker Compose YAML file because that's exactly what it is. In this case, we have a list of services and there is Webpack. There's also this example file as well, which we'll go over in a bit. But for now, you might be wondering like, Nick, why go through all the trouble? Why to this override pattern and put Webpack here when you can just go to this compose file here and put it at the bottom or wherever, you know, and that is a really good question. And, you know, this override pattern comes in very handy when you want to run certain containers in development, 
but not in production. And in this case, when it comes to Webpack, we saw that the Webpack Watcher is uh, running here in development, which is awesome because it means if you change your JavaScript or CSS, then you'll be able to just go to your browser, reload and see it while Webpack updates in 100 milliseconds or whatever, you know, however long it takes. But in production, typically you wouldn't be running this Webpack development server. Instead, you'd just be running your web app and your database and everything else. But, you know, Webpack will produce bundled CSS and JavaScript files that you can then directly serve from Nginx or, you know, whatever tool that you want to serve your assets from, maybe a CDN, etc. And uh, what this override pattern allows you to do is define something like what we see here where Webpack is in the override file. But then in production, this override file wouldn't make its way onto the system. You know, let's just say that you're deploying to a VPS and you're running Docker Compose up there. So, and this also falls into why we have the example file as well, because, you know, in development, it's going to combine this Compose file and the override file. Everything is going to run and it's going to be amazing. But I actually do have this override file, the YAML one, get ignored in here. So if I go to the get ignore file, then we can see this override file is ignored. And by the way, you know, I have the same pattern here for the ENVs. So that ENV has sensitive information in it. Totally don't want to have that stuff uh, commit to version control where you might have something like Stripe keys or API credentials. But we do have the example ENV file as well. I know I'm jumping around, but you know, this really relates to this. But this example file is commit to version control. It doesn't have any secrets in there. It's meant to be used as basically documentation. And we have the same exact pattern here for the override file. So this file that we see here, the override file, it is exactly the same as the one that we just looked at, but this one's actually commit to version control because when you clone down the repo, then you can just do like, you know, copy Docker compose override example to the regular override. And then in development, you're all good to go. But since it's ignored from version control, the actual file itself, when you push your code up to your server, uh, then the override file won't be there. And suddenly Webpack is not running in production. Instead, you can just serve the assets directly and you don't get this extra container. So this is a really, really nice pattern because, you know, typically if you weren't aware of this pattern, you might go down the route of having something like a Docker Compose dev file and like a Docker Compose prod file. And before you know it, you have all this duplication between all these files. And really you're just like, you know, wanting to control whether or not one container is running in dev versus prod. So that's really the first pattern of this file, the override file. And there's another pattern here to reduce some duplication as well, because, you know, if we scroll down here, we have the web service as well as the worker service. And both of these services are very, very similar. So, you know, if you've never worked with a background worker before, typically what ends up happening is they both, the background worker and the web server use the same exact Docker file. And the only, only, only difference is the worker will just run a different command. So, you know, this is Docker one-on-one -on -one stuff, but if I jump to like the bottom of this Docker file, which we're gonna get into by the way, a little bit later, uh, this runs Geonicorn, which is the web server in Python. And, you know, we just have this set as a CMD, all good to go. You know, that's pretty standard stuff here. And if we look at the web service here, uh, notice that there's no command being defined because it's just going to use the uh, CMD by default. But when it comes to the worker, you know, it's running that celery background worker instead. But the interesting takeaway here is, you know, take a look at the syntax here where we're defining you know, some crazy looking pointer thing with a reference to somewhere. And this is called uh, aliases and anchors, and it's a YAML feature. And uh, it combines with another feature from Docker Compose called extension field. So if I jump to the very top of this file, we have this uh, extension field defined for the app. And by the way, this app and this app doesn't need to line up. But notice how we just have a whole bunch of different uh, properties for Docker Compose defined here, like the build, the context, what arguments get passed in, you know, depends on ENV, you know, all these properties here. But if we jump back down to the bottom of the file, Notice that the web service and the worker service, they're both referencing that extension field. You know, you can think of it kind of like a variable, right? And all of those properties at the very top of the file that we were looking at up here, they're basically going to be, you know, essentially copy pasted down here, except we're not actually copy pasting it, right? We can reference them like a variable. And uh, what's really neat about this one is, you know, we might have something like six or seven common properties between multiple services, in this case, the web and the worker, and we can share all of them. But then when it comes to something like the web, we might have some extra things that we want to set or, you know, even for now, specifically for the worker, it's like we want to set that custom command. So we can just define other properties that we want to set here for specifically on the worker and specifically for the web. Like for the web, there's a health check here because, you know, it, it's actually like an HTTP web server, but the worker is not. And then likewise, you know, we want to uh, publish some ports here for the web, but not for the worker. So, you know, we have really nice control here to basically put all of our duplicated stuff into one property up here. And by the way, it needs to start with X dash. That's just part of the uh, compose spec. If you didn't do that, then you're going to get an error because 
because Compose won't recognize the field. But uh, yeah, that's basically how that works. And also, you know, if you did happen to have that defined, you know, a couple properties in this, but you wanted to override one specifically for like the worker, you know, that's not an example here, but let's just say for argument's sake, I wanted to, I don't know, set the stop grace period to be 10 seconds on the worker. You can just redefine it down here and uh, it'll take uh, precedence over here when it's defined. So yeah, that's a really nice way to just reduce duplication. So now let's talk a little bit about environment variables because they are being used all over the place. So this is called variable interpolation. It's a feature of Docker Compose and it's very similar to how uh, variable interpolation works on the shell. So for example, when it comes to something like the health check here, you know, Docker Compose will let you define a variable with dollar sign squigglies and then this environment variable here. And if it happens to be not defined, then it is going to fall back to using this value by default. Now keep in mind, uh, we are referencing things like env file with a .env file here, but this is separate to this variable interpolation that's happening in Docker Compose. And using environment variable interpolation like this is really nice because it really dries out our Compose file and makes it available for us to tweak certain properties here or there for dev versus prod. And that's what we see being used all over this file. So in this case, when you run a Docker Compose up and other Compose commands, uh, when you're doing variable interpolation like this, it's going to look for a .env file specifically. And, you know, this comes in really, really handy because, you know, let's go back down here to this health check. And, and by the way, you know, I'm jumping around a little bit, but, you know, health checks are really important. So, you know, in the context of environment variables, let's go over this health check first because you may have seen this health check being defined in a Docker file before because, you know, that is a valid thing to do. But personally, in my opinion, I really like having the health check being defined in the Docker Compose YAML file because it allows us, one, to change our health check at runtime just through an environment variable. But two, it also makes our code a little bit more agnostic to which container platform or tools that you're using to run it. For example, you know, you might be running this project on a single VPS with Docker Compose, but, you know, what if you run your application in a Kubernetes cluster? Well, you know, Kubernetes is going to... Uh, automatically ignore the health check instruction in your Docker file. So, you know, why go even through the motions of having to expect another tool to do something like that when we can just define it here in the compose file. So basically the health check is only being used when we're using compose or swarm, et cetera, et cetera. And having it uh, be changeable at runtime is also a really nice thing because if you're working with an application in development, so, you know, here's the output of the logs, right? If I go back to this page here, and, you know, I reload a couple times here, just hitting F5, and I jump over to these logs, we can see all this log output, right? It doesn't matter what the logs say, but, you know, this is the web server just saying, hey, by the way, you know, you access this at blah, 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 blah. You know, here's the HTTP 200 for the homepage. But uh, if you have a health check running here, and let's say, you know, every minute, and it's running and hitting this up endpoint, which we'll go over in a second, by the way, then every single time, every single minute in your logs, you're just going to get like health check, health check, health check, health check. And you're just like, shut up, man. Like, I just want to look at my logs in peace because I'm trying to debug some code, right? So do it up in production. But in development, let's just override that health check to be something else. So if we take a look here at the env file and I do a uh, search here for health check, we can see in development, we are overwriting that to run the bin true command. So if you're brand new to the command line, you know, if you run bin true, then it's basically doing the most minimal work possible to do absolutely nothing, but it still returns back an exit code zero, meaning that it is going to pass any health check, right? It's basically saying like, yes, this works. So in development, we don't get spammed by our health check logs, but in production, we get to curl things up uh, as we do. Now, going back to this compose file here for the health check, health check specifically, you know, uh, this is not specific to Flask, right? It's a really good idea, in my opinion, at least, to put a health check endpoint in all of your applications. So actually, let's uh, switch gears real quick and just take a look at that really quick. Uh, I promise you it's not going to be very uh, crazy code to look at here. But this is uh, the Flask health check endpoint. It's in slash up. It doesn't matter where you put it. That's just a convention I like to use. And uh, all it does is it returns an empty 200 uh, body response here, but it also runs a uh, raw SQL command here to make sure we can do a select one in our database as well as ping Redis to make sure that it's up, right? In my opinion, it's a really great idea for your health check to do, you know, not just returning like a status code 200, but also checking to make sure if you can connect to the resources that you need, like a database, Redis, whatever you need. And, uh, you know, it adds a couple microseconds to this check, but it is totally well worth it because, you know, these services need to be up for your application to work. And, you know, doing something like a select one is uh, a very, 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 very basic uh, SQL command to run. For example, you know, if I go and run run psql here, by the way, this run script is a part of this example application. Can't get into this for the sake of the video, but it gives you some convenience functions, so you don't need to run really long Docker Compose exec commands. But, you know, if I run select one here, you know, from a psql prompt, it's just basically returning the back, yeah, the sql uh, command worked, which is really nice because this says that suddenly like, you know, our database is configured properly and we can connect to it. Likewise with Redis, you know, you can run a ping command and it just responds with Pong. So yeah, very minimal health check. And uh, that is how I have the health check set up.
you know, if you're using Rails or Django or something else, uh, you can take a look at those apps. They have uh, health checks to find there as well. Now, let's continue onwards, though, and talk a little bit more about environment variables because they are being used all over the place. For example, when it comes to setting things like, uh, let's see, the ports here, right? I have Docker web port forward, and then I'm just basically forwarding ports uh, 8,000 to 8,000 in the container. So, you know, this application itself, you know, internally is running on port 8,000, but then I'm also publishing back port 8,000 as well. But, you know, maybe you've seen something like this in a compose file where you might just see, you know, 8,000 colon 8,000, you know, whether or not it's in quotes, not important. And, you know, this is totally fine, but this doesn't really work that that nicely in production. I mean, technically it could work, but it, there's some implications about this because when you don't define this with the 127001, uh, localhost essentially, then this, assuming you don't have like a cloud firewall in front of your infrastructure in production, this is going to expose or not expose, it's going to publish this port to the host. So technically like the entire internet will be able to access your application at, you know, example.com colon 8,000, which uh, wouldn't be very good at all. So what I like to do is, uh, I like to make this an environment variable that, you know, by default will bind this to only local host port 8000, but the internet won't be able to connect to this service at all. So that is really nice. But you might be wondering like, well, you know, why go through all that trouble? Like where's Nginx by the way? And uh, when it comes to using Nginx, I really like to run Nginx directly on my Docker host. So this is kind of where this pattern comes together. So the idea basically is I'll compose up, you know, dash D or whatever in production and, uh, Nginx will be running on the same exact server and Nginx is going to be, you know, available to connect to this web server uh, over localhost port 8000. So Nginx can connect, you know, it can start doing what it needs to do, like, you know, setting up, uh, you know, SSL certificates and serving things as a proxy, you know, serving all the assets, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, you know, I can't get into it for the sake of time here, but uh, I do have a blog post about Nginx and why I like to run it on a Docker host. I'll leave a link to that one in the references, but long story short, environment variables, Yes, we are saying let's do that for localhost port 8000. But, you know, sometimes if I go back to the env file here and uh, we look up somewhere, I think it's down here. Yeah, here it is for the web port forward. You know, in development, I just go for the 8000 colon 8000 and, you know, it's accessible anywhere because, you know, you might be running Docker Toolbox or some legacy system, or maybe you're running Docker in a VM where you just can't connect over localhost or, you know, in development, you might want to check what the website looks like on a whole bunch of different devices, right? You might have uh, like a laptop or, you know, an iPad or whatever it is. And uh, in that case, you don't want to have it locked down to just localhost. You want anyone to be able to connect on your local network. So that's why I have that set up to be an environment variable. So going back to this compose file here, let's take a look at some other environment variables here. And we can see there's some for, uh, you know, web CPUs and memories. Uh, these are slightly different uh, for worker and web. If you're wondering like, hey, why did you duplicate deploy? Like they are slightly different. It's a really good idea, in my opinion, to put some memory and CPU constraints on your container containers, you know, they default to zero right now, but, uh, you know, if you know for sure that your container is going to use like 200 megs of memory or something like that, you can put that there. It just becomes a little more friendly if you're going to bring things into Kubernetes or another orchestration service. But uh, let's uh, punt on that idea for now and just continue going over other environment variables that are pretty useful. Like, for example, like the restart policy. So by default in production, it is going to be set to unless stopped, which, you know, again, I really like the idea of defaulting to things in production so that in development, it's very, very, very easy to just like clone on the repo, copy the env file, and everything is set in the env file in development. But in production, you don't really need to set too many environment variables. Uh, but unless stopped is really nice in production because, you know, if you reboot your box, then Docker will restart your container automatically or start it up automatically, which is really nice. But also, you know, if your container crashes and it's set up in such a way that it can actually recover and it's like an infinite crash, then, you know, unless stopped, they'll keep trying, uh, you know, and your containers will be able to basically self-heal. But, you know, in development, that's pretty kind of not nice, right? Like imagine you reboot your dev box and suddenly like every container you ever ran and, you know, every project starts like booting up. So in that case, what I like to do in the env file there is I just set the restart policy to be no, so that in development, uh, these containers don't come up on their own, uh, which is exactly what we want. Suddenly we have dev pride parity for something else. So going through this file, let's see, what else do we have here? We have the volume as well. Yeah, so let's wrap things up environment variable wise for the Docker web volume. So uh, in production, you know, as mentioned before with Nginx, right? Nginx is running on the same host as Docker, but the actual Nginx itself is running directly on the Docker host. And you know, if you don't know too much about Nginx, right, it's a web server, it does a lot of great stuff, can't really get into it for the sake of time, but it has this idea of like being able to serve static files. And, 
Uh, in the case of this Flask application, I have this public directory here. You know, it might be a little bit different with Rails. Well, technically Rails is a public directory, but other frameworks might have this in a different spot. But, you know, this is like where your HTML and your final CSS and JavaScript is. And we just tell like Nginx, hey, you know, it needs to be able to read these files and uh, or directory. So in this case for the volume, I just expose that public directory in production and then Nginx can read that happily. It's all good. But in development, you know, if you're hacking away on your application, you want to be able to just change your app and then have uh, the ability to reload your browser and see the change. So in development, then if I go back to the env file here, down here, we can see that uh, it is just going to basically bind mount everything, right? The current directory into slash app, and then suddenly we get all the nice goodness in development where we can just hack around on our code base and see the updates automatically. So within like a second or so. But now let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the Docker file. So this Docker file is taking advantage of multi-stage builds, and there's two of them. There's one for Webpack, which is running in a node image here, the official node image. And then down here, there's another stage for the Flask application running in the official Python image. And I like to separate my stages here using a single comment. It just makes it a little bit easier at a glance to see when I'm jumping to a different stage, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily a best practice. And in terms of best practices in general, you know, these are more like opinions, right? Patterns I've picked up over the years. They're not necessarily like, hey, I'm doing this this way and everyone else is wrong. Like if you want to use these patterns, great. I kind of see them as moving targets, right? Uh, as Docker matures uh, as a tool and I get better as a developer and figure out new patterns, you know, these things are definitely going to change over time. But as of right now, you know, this is the current way that I happen to do things. And, uh, you know, for the sake of time, I can't really go over this file in super detail. So let's go over some patterns that you might be able to apply to your Docker files. And one of them is running your containers as the non root user. So we can see here, we're switching over to the node user and the official node image on the Docker hub, it does create the node user for you by default, but it doesn't switch to it. It's on you to switch to it. And that makes sense because you might want to run things like an app get update, or if you're using Alpine, like you might want to use APK there to run things as a root user. And then you can switch to the node user. You can install your dependent and then you can run whatever command that you want to run. If it's a Webpack dev watcher or a node server, it's really up to you. There's really nothing specific to this uh, stage here that's for Webpack. I labeled it Webpack because in the context of this application, it is managing the Webpack environment. But uh, you know, when it comes more generally to installing things with a package manager, specifically in this case, we're working with Yarn, uh, I do like to take a look here at this Yarn RC file and configure this to install these dependencies to a different location that is not going to be value mounted in development. So when it comes to node, I'm installing things to slash node modules. You know, if I'm working with Elixir and Phoenix, I might mix install things to uh, like slash mix. You know, it really depends on what ecosystem I'm working with. But the idea here is, you know, I don't want all of these node modules or packages to ever be value mounted back to my dev box because we all know the memes around node modules, right? <laughs> They're pretty heavy. Uh, I don't want hundred million files value mounted back to my dev box every time I start a container in development. So I like to put them in a custom location and uh, you know, I'm actually making that directory here first and then making sure the ownership of that directory is owned by the node user as well as the, the app directory here because ultimately, you know, that's where the worker ends up being set. But you know, this line's really important uh, because it changes the ownership to the node user so that when we do a yarn install, it is not gonna get like permission errors. And then, you know, there's other parts of this uh, file that are very, very, uh, I guess Docker 101, right? Like we're copying in our package JSON file, installing our dependencies, installing everything else. And then this line over here is super specific to per CSS and Webpack. Can't really get into it for the sake of time, but just understand that this one application like hello directory, which is also in the sidebar down here, you know, this needs to be copied in so that per CSS can actually find our templates to make sure that all of our CSS uh, gets purged correctly when we're using Tailwind. But uh, yeah, other patterns here, we're using, uh, taking, taking advantage here of build arguments. So we have the node environment being Set to production. And the reason why this is a build argument is down here, we're actually doing two different things depending on what the value of that node environment variable is at build time, you know, much different than runtime. Because if this node ENV is set to development, then we actually don't want to build our Webpack assets because that takes like 15, 20 seconds. You know, we're going to get our assets from over here, right? From the Webpack container, it's happily going to serve them. We don't need to like build production assets in development. So this if condition basically says, you know, if we're in a, a non-development environment, then let's do that. Let's get, you know, let's run the production uh, build here and get our finalized assets. Otherwise, let's just basically do nothing. Let's just create a, a public directory that's going to correctly be owned by the node user because we're all set up to run this as uh, the node user. But yeah, that's just one way to differentiate a Docker file for dev and prod and still be able to use the same file. Because, you know, if I jump back over to the compose file here, you know, this build argument is being passed in through here, through the build args. So we have one for node and one for Flask. Ultimately, these end up being environment variables in the env file, which is up here, and uh, they default to production, but you can over, you know, override them to be development in development. So that's how like that whole chain of events happens, right? They default to production as the build arguments, and then uh, 
Ultimately, in development, this gets skipped, but in production, they get run. And then we have our final assets in that public directory, which in this stage now for the Flask application, we are going to end up being uh, copying them in over here. So, you know, we'll get to some other stuff up here in a second, but, you know, I just want to complete that chain here. So eventually, you know, we're going to copy in files owned by Python, but from this build stage from Webpack into this one uh, app public directory, you know, this is where we're the the source of this right from the other webpack build stage into slash public here now you might be wondering like why not copy this into slash app slash public and we'll get there in a second but for now you know that's basically how uh, all of these compiled final like tiny little css and javascript and images get over into this uh build stage here for the flask application without lugging along that entire massive you know node modules and you know the whole webpack environment uh, this is really efficient because you know our final image now is going to be very small and it's only going to have what it needs to have but now let's talk a little bit more more, right about this uh, application uh, stage itself, the Python one. You know, so the Python one, it actually doesn't create a Python user for you by default. So down here, I actually am creating a Python user with our home directory, you know, just so it adheres to some best practices when it comes to Unix tools. Like some of them will expect the home directory to be set. And by the way, I should jump back to here too. Speaking of Unix best practices, uh, it's a really good idea to set a environment variable of your user set to whatever user that you happen to be using because some tools will potentially maybe read from that. And if it doesn't exist, it could cause some weird like uh, edge cases or side effects. So, you know, even though we are running this in Docker, I do like to set this environment variable. We're not really taking too big of a hit here because we are setting the node environment as an environment variable here. So we already have that one layer set up. We're just taking advantage of being able to set multiple environment variables in one layer. So now going back to down here, you know, like before with, uh, the node example, we do switch over to the Python user. And also like before, we are making sure the ownership of the app directory is owned by the Python user. Then we do very similar uh, things that we did before with the node environment for Webpack, where it's kind of like, you know, copy in our requirements at text file. This is basically a package JSON, but for Python, then we uh, do a pip install. But in this case, it's actually running a custom shell script that I wrote, which actually handles the idea of creating a lock file for Python. So you may want to check that out on your own time. Can't really go into that one here, but it's effectively a pip install, but it's running it as the Python user. There's like dash dash user flag. And then, you know, down here, we also copy in uh, all of our source code. So we take advantage of the layer caching there. And in between that, you know, we copy in uh, what we went over before, right? For the for the actual uh, assets itself. Now, there are a couple of, of environment variables set here. A lot of them are specific to Flask, but uh, if you are working with Django or another Python uh, web framework, you know, setting the Python path to be the current directory, which is going to be slash app here is a really good idea. You might want to set that. Then we're also taking advantage of the same pattern here for the Flask ENV and build arguments because down here we're running something slightly different versus dev and prod. For example, if it's not in development, then we run something called a Flask digest compile. Now, if you're working with Rails, uh, Django and Phoenix, they all have this idea of being able to like pre-compile your assets so you can have like MD5 tagged assets. And Flask doesn't do this by default, but I did write this extension that allows you to do that. You know, that's what these lines are for here. So going down to here, you know, we also have expose 8,000, you know, technically don't need to set that, but it is a best practice because then when you do like a Docker PS, you can see what ports are expected to be connected to. And, you know, we have this entry point over here, which we'll get to in a second, but finally down here, you know, we have the command. There is two ways to write this command. We are using the array syntax here. Basically, you know, we can, we can see each argument is in its own string here uh, in the array. But another way to do this would be to basically just, you know, write it all out as one big string here, not as an array. And one difference between this is when you run uh, the array syntax, G unicorn in this case is going to be uh, PID1 in the container. But if you did the string variant of that, then bash or whatever shell that you have configured is going to be PID1. Uh, one, I guess, gotcha around this is, you know, you can't do any uh, shell scripting here. So like if you wanted to do like and and or whatever, you'd have to do the string syntax and not the array syntax. But now let's get back to this entry point here. And, you know, before we look at this file, notice here that we are copying in our assets here from the webpack one to slash public. So now let's take a look here at this entry point file. And this will run when the container starts and, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want in an entry file. But uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're actually removing all of the assets that we have in this public directory. And then we're copying in from that slash public directory, the new assets that were copied over from Webpack. And that's actually going to copy these into slash app slash public, because that's basically what the copy command does here. You know, it will put them in public, you know, then we can actually volume mount them out on the host and Nginx can read them nicely. Can't really go too much deeper than that for the sake of time here. But uh, if you know a better way to do this, let me know. But this pattern has been working very nicely in practice. And, you know, going back to this 
just compose YAML file real quick here on the bottom. Notice for the web worker, you know, we're not really dealing with assets there. So we just set the entry point to be empty so that it actually doesn't do any work. I noticed that without this line here, I was getting some copy errors because there was a race condition where the web server and the worker were both starting very, very quickly. And the copy command like didn't know what the heck to do because it was trying to like overwrite itself or something like that. So yeah, that's everything I have here. I know it was pretty fast, definitely glared over some stuff in the Docker file, but uh, for the sake of time, can't really go over anything more. You know, if you want to check out some more stuff in detail, I do have a blog where I write about this stuff in a little bit more detail. And uh, I do have a new course coming out around deploying applications with Docker and friends. So you can always check out the courses section here to check that out. With that said, thanks a lot for watching. I really appreciate your time. If you have any comments, I'll answer them below. Thanks a lot and uh, enjoy DockerCon.